date of birth, 25th of May, 1901. Oh, his mother has given birth to him, held him in her arms. She was happy, maybe. Place of birth, Vastsava, Warsaw. Learning the Sutterlin alphabet at primary school has been good for something, at least. I liked it. It was beautiful and interesting. Oh no, this one was only 16 years old. As old as my grandson. Oh, my own date of birth. 20 years back. Prisoner number 150383. 150,383. Stanislav deceased five days after being imprisoned. In April 1955, a month before the war ended. Herzlich willkommen bei Asra Blog. Ich bin Asra. Heute habe ich ein schweres Thema. I am copying index cards of prisoners of Dachau. Everybody can take part in digitalizing the index cards of the concentration camps online at the Arolsen Archives. It is quite easy. You register at the website of the Arolsen Archives. There you can choose what you want to work on. The old font is only on the Polish cards. The others are easier to read. The help files are detailed and easy to understand. More than 100,000 helpers have been involved yet, worldwide. Why are they doing this? First of all, there are relatives and descendants who are researching the fate of their family. Only in digitalized indexes they have a chance to find something. Families scattered all over the world have found together already. Scientists, journalists and hobby researchers are making use of the archives. And after all, it's a monument against forgetting. Sometimes I'm feeling sick while I'm copying the cards, but somehow I can't stop either. You get drawn in. You imagine faces, families, stories. Why am I doing this? Maybe doing this work has to do with the uncle who was a serving officer in the German army on the Eastern Front. They got per Weitin before their operations. You don't want to imagine what was happening there. Maybe it also has to do with the great uncle, known as a hardcore Nazi, a retired teacher. Once he screamed in the face of his Spartacus great nephew that he personally made sure of a father of five children being imprisoned in a concentration camp in the open street, in broad daylight, that was in the 60s. Maybe it also has to do with the anti-Jewish statements in the letters of our great-grandfather. One of our grandfathers used his authority as a doctor to prevent a recently operated patient, a Jew, from being deported. The other grandfather was a defense officer. Without his warning about an air raid coming, which was forbidden under penalty of death, me, my brothers and sisters, my children and grandchildren very likely would not exist. The house was completely bombed to ground. He knew everything. Sometimes he talked about sisters of the children's psychiatric clinic of my hometown, telling him that doctors had come from Berlin, medicated the children and that the children had died afterwards. He said he didn't believe it then. Copying the index cards maybe also has to do with a doctoral thesis of my father. The title was Mortuary Findings in Consanguineous Mental Patients. His PhD supervisor was a Professor Panze. Ernst Klee writes about him, citation, lecturer teaching racial hygiene, NSDAP, T4 expert, galvanic current in high doses known as punzing against so-called war neurotics. Acquittal District Court, Düsseldorf, 1950, for involvement in euthanasia. Was my father a Nazi? Was my father a Nazi? He sometimes talked about that at his school they were jumping for joy when they were told that their last year would be shortened and every 17-year-old would like, don't trust anyone over 30, wouldn't he? That it had been the disappointment of his life learning about the camps after the war. Our father did not murder patients and he did not conduct human experiments. But how was it possible not to see how and why the 60 corpses he dissected had died? That they had been murdered? My father has written a book about interesting people he met during his life. In maybe the most warm-hearted and touching chapter, he writes about three schizophrenic brothers. How do you bring this together? I don't remember in which report about the lawsuits it was that I read about the human experiments 
that Nazi doctors conducted on psychiatry patients and prisoners. There was an assistant who was accused of having taken part in a cold experiment. By these cold experiments they wanted to find the most effective protection against freeze for the German soldiers sent into war against Russia. The doctor had ordered his assistant to lower the temperature further down. It was obvious that the patient would die. The exact time of death and the duration of surviving was noted meticulously. The assistant trusted the doctor, his superior, an authority and studied professional. The assistant was dependent, maybe he had a family to care for. He followed the order. I would possibly have done the same in those times, timid as I was at the age of 20. Having to admit this thought was awful. All this is not gone, it is still there, it is inherent in each of us. This is why it is so important to remember, to face the fact that possibly you would have taken part, how close this is to let it in, and to face the fact that it can happen again. And nothing can ever be made up for. Und nichts kann man jemals wieder gut machen. Well, there have been men and women who did not take part, in those times and in every time. Men and women who refused to follow the orders, at the risk of their lives. They also exist today, in Russia, in China, in Iran, everywhere. If I imagine myself in the shoes of the assistant at the lawsuit, what would I have needed to be able to refuse the order of my superior? I think it is respect I would have needed. Not the kind of respect you are expected to have for the authorities, the powerful, the rich, the old, the superiors, the high profiles, the elevated, the reputables, the prominents, the priests, the teachers and the fathers, but the respect of parents for their child. The respect of teachers for their pupils. The respect for everyone. The respect for the uniqueness of everyone. Respecting children? Are you kidding? Unheard of in the 50s, 60s, absurd, unthinkable, ridiculous. The old spirit was still in power. So were the old judges, teachers and priests. When we were kids, we had both respect, politeness and love, but also contempt, obedience and fear. Disrespect invites disrespect. Violence incites violence. When the powerful use their position to bully others, we all lose. It was that moment when the person asking to sit in the most respected seat in our country imitated a disabled reporter, someone he outranked in privilege, power, and the capacity to fight back. It kind of broke my heart when I saw it, and I still can't get it out of my head because it wasn't in a movie. It was real life. And this instinct to humiliate, when it's modeled by someone on the public platform, by someone powerful. It filters down into everybody's life because it kind of gives permission for other people to do the same thing. We wanted to change everything in those times and challenge the authorities, extremely disrespectfully. Some of it was exaggerated and obstinate, but it was an absolute must. It was funny too, has changed some too. But especially now, in times of crisis, the old longing for authorities is getting tailwind. Well, the wind of change is picking up mightily strong these days. But there are so many atrocities happening on Earth right now. Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, Kurdistan, poverty, hunger, diseases, species extinction, climate crisis. Doesn't humanity learn anything from history? Most people do not believe it. I didn't believe it at first. But with all the atrocities and cruelties people do to each other and don't prevent, we are actually living in a world with less violence than ever before in history. This is a fact even if you count both world wars and the Holocaust. Violence has decreased permanently through the times. We are living now in the most peaceful era of mankind. And why is everybody convinced that things are getting worse and worse? That is because only bad news are news. We are informed about a pupil's knife attack, but never hear about the hundreds of thousands of pupils not attacking others with a knife. Which is because our basic instincts are programmed on danger. 
danger triggers much faster reactions than boring, normal or pleasant events. Being frightened we react instinctively, unreflectively. That we think things are getting worse and worse is also due to the fact that more people than ever are sitting at the table, even those who until now never had anything to say. And also that we have become more sensitive. Women don't put up with everything anymore, neither do kids, people of color and all the others. We don't want animals to be tortured and we do not go to the marketplace with our children to watch the public execution on Sundays. It has been proved. After all, we have learned something from history. We, the humans, have evolved and we are getting on with it. But what about our respect for our great mother Earth? Finally, we are beginning to understand that we ourselves are getting in trouble if we go on treating her so disrespectfully. It is time for her to come and sit at the table with us, the plants, the animals, the rivers and the oceans. But that is another chapter. I am sitting at my table copying the index cards of the concentration camp Dachau when I hear the radio telling about Jews being attacked and spit at in the streets because they are Jews in Germany, in Germany of all places. They are afraid to send their children to school by themselves. In Germany, members of a party sitting in the Bundestag, the German parliament, think it a good idea to expatriate Germans who do not look German enough. But that is unbearable, isn't it? And I just don't want to bear that. However, I have to deal with it somehow. One thing I can say is, it helps to do something. It helps if you can give a home to a Ukrainian family. It helps to copy index cards of the Aral and Archives now and then, even if doing it you are feeling sick sometimes. Macht's gut, ihr guten Menschen. Bis zum nächsten Mal.